Welcome to This Week in Hearing. I'm your host, Bob Trader, and I have a couple of very special guests with me today who uh, have been involved in the development of a vestibular uh, device, which could be of extreme benefit to our patients with vestibular disorders. Today, my guests are Sam Owen from Otolith Labs and the Chief Science Officer at Otolith Labs, Dr. Didier Dupree. And, uh, and I appreciate your, your indulgence as I, as I introduce you very, very terribly. Um, but let's, uh, let's move on to, to looking at the device itself. Now, uh, Sam, did you need to have me uh, set you up so you can show some slides? Sure. So, yeah, so let, let me know what the, the first question is, and I'll, I'll go to the, the my, proper My slide. first question is, Sam, give us a little idea of how you came about. Number one, I, I know your background is, is in physics, but how did you come about to work with the vestibular system and, and so on and, and, and look at founding this company for this particular purpose? Yeah, so as, as you said, my background is actually physics. It's, it's not in medicine. Um, and when I was working on a PhD in physics, I had taken a course in acceleration sensors. And then I happened to read this article that you have acceleration sensors in your inner ear called the vestibular system. And you know, just as a curious scientist, I was like, well, I understand how acceleration sensors work. I wonder if I can interact with that. And, and the acceleration sensors in the inner ear really do work exactly like an acceleration sensor in a car or a phone or something like that does. They, there are inertial sensors. And what I mean by that is they're typically composed of two primary things. There's some mass and then there's some force sensor. In the presence of some acceleration, the inertia of those mass uh, will essentially hold things in place, which will then cause uh, stimulation of that force sensor. And again, um, very much like what I learned right in, uh, in uh, school, except, you know, in this case, the mass, instead of it being a weight is the otoliths. And instead of being a piezo or some other force sensor, it's the cilia. And so very straightforward to understand as a physicist, I was just like, well, I wonder if I can interact with the human acceleration sensor somehow. Um, and the idea of introducing mechanical stimulation um, seemed pretty straightforward. You use, you know, a loudspeaker, use a, you know, bass speaker. And eventually I found out about bone conduction and how there's already this technology that's designed to transmit through the skull to, um, to the hearing organ. And right next, that's the vestibular system. So I want to see, can I use some sort of off the shelf component to, to, to do that? Um, it is possible to do it with off the shelf components. I was actually able to build a prototype with off the shelf components. And again, if you're just trying to vibrate things, it's, it's not that difficult. Um, the issue is trying to do it safely. And so uh, great for lab experiments. I had something that, uh, that worked. Originally, we started trying to treat motion sickness. I get terrible car sickness. I was the very first person to, to be tested. Uh, that's how actually I was able to bring Didier Depereau onto the team was he also gets car sick and uh, he was pretty skeptical until he tried it. And then he's like, wow, there's, there's actually something here. And then it was only later on that we realized that we can put this into, um, use this to treat vertigo. It took us about two years, but eventually um, we were able to develop a new technology that um, basically is small enough to be worn, uh, yet incredibly efficient, incredibly silent and is safe to be worn for extended amount of times and it treats vertigo. An interesting thing, and I, and I understand that, that um, in, in some of the background information that it was given, um, the device was pretty big to start with, but now it's been, it's been digested into a smaller, smaller device. And Dr. Dupro, do you have some, uh, I, I know you are originally, were originally at the University of Maryland, but, uh, but now uh, working with Otolith Labs in DC. And, and uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you've been involved in the development of this product? Yes, I was in academia for a long time, uh, mostly involved in research on the in-ear pathways with a position at the School of Medicine and a position in the engineering department in College Park. 
And um, I was looking to do something a little more concrete than what you can do in academia. I was doing research mostly in tinnitus. And then it's a long story, but as Sam said, he wound up contacting me and I thought this, there's no way this works, but he was pretty persuasive. So to shut him up, I tested it on myself. And for the first time in my life, I was able to read in the back of a car. And so I thought, you know, I need to join this. But at some level, it made sense because, you know, for instance, in tinnitus, you can have tinnitus maskers that provide relief for about half of the tinnitus population or so by simply adding noise, masking the tinnitus. You can still hear the tinnitus, but you can cope with it, you can ignore it. And I saw a lot of analogies between what I found early on with Sam's device and tinnitus. It was like having a noise masker, but instead of being for tinnitus or the hearing, it was for the vestibular system. It, we believe it works as a masker for the vestibular system. And um, so then after that, once I joined, it was a question of doing research in order to you know, focus on the parameters that are actually important and having opinions from the ENTs and reorienting ourselves also towards, you know, motion sickness is important, but you can live even if you have motion sickness, whereas vertigo patients uh, were a very interesting group that we felt we could help. And we had a lot of indications early on, we could really help a lot of people with vestibular issues. I know those of us that see patients every day in the clinic, um, we do see a lot of patients who are unsteady or have a little dizziness rather than not necessarily vertiginous, but, but some dizziness that goes along with things. And I also see that, um, that one of your, your ENT uh, research people that's, uh, that's associated with your company is Dr. Michael Hoffer, who, uh, who was with us on our uh, American, um, the American Tinnitus Association board for a number of years as well. So I know that he's probably involved in, in, in providing some of the ENT information, which does offer substantial credibility as well to the project. Um, I know that you guys just, uh, just got some, some new funding to facilitate your research and development process. And uh, uh, Sam, would you like to talk about that just a little bit? Uh, sure, it's a little bit premature to speak too much of it. We we oh, did okay. raise uh, so at this point we've raised three point eight million dollars, and we've also received one point eight million dollars in non dilutive funding from uh, groups like the Air Force and the Defense Health Agency who care about vertigo and care about motion sickness. Um, but we are currently looking to raise somewhere between around eight to around twenty million dollars to get us through our pivotal trial, get FDA approval. Um, and if we raise more like the 20 million, um, raise the sales for, build a sales force and actually bring it to market. Um, yeah. So, uh, so what, what do you think this technology is going to do to the standard of care? And I'll throw that out to, to either of you guys to, uh, to facilitate that answer. Yeah. So this is the current patient clinical path that we've come to understand is that when vertigo first comes on or, you know, severe dizziness, it's a very scary experience. Um, you know, oftentimes people will end up at the ER. Um, very quickly, people want to test, is this a stroke? Is this something that's time sensitive? Over 90% of the time, it's a peripheral vestibular disorder. It may be completely debilitating, but it's not going to kill you. So the ER docs just want to get rid of that patient. They prescribe antivert, Valium, some sort of suppressant. It knocks you out, and hopefully in a couple of days when you come get better, uh, when you wake up, you're, you're better and the vertigo is resolved. But for the millions and millions of people where they aren't better, usually the first touch point is the ENT. And you know, in ENT, there, there's, there's not a lot of, there's no imaging that will tell you what's causing your vertigo, except for in a few rare cases. It's, it's hearing the natural history, seeing if you're responsive to the Epley maneuver, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and so there, you're given one diagnosis and it, it might be that you kind of fit what looks like migraines and ENTs and audiologists don't like prescribing migraine medication because that is outside their field. So they send someone to a neurologist. Neurologists might prescribe migraine medication. Maybe it works. Maybe there's an adverse event to it. Um, maybe it doesn't fully solve the vertigo. And oftentimes, uh, they end up right back at the ENT or the audiologist. 
and they'll try something else. Okay, go see a physical therapist. All right, well, they go to see a physical therapist and you know, the provocative maneuvers are really, um, you know, they get sick, they, they have trouble with it. And this revolving door of medicine is really what chronic vertigo patients run into. So there's been a bunch of studies, but basically chronic vertigo patients have seen somewhere between three and seven specialists. Uh, a study done by the Vestibular Disorders Association um, showed that only 20% report an accurate and timely diagnosis. And you know, eventually people just become these, these self-care experts where uh, they join the Vestibular Disorders Association or other support groups and just, you know, what is helping anyone and does it work for me? I'll, I'll go see a chiropractor across the country if it just stops my vertigo. Um, and what we are hoping to do is stop this cycle. So the, going back to the, the original question, how are we changing the standard of care? There is no standard of care treatment for the symptom management of chronic vertigo and dizziness patients. The antiverts, the uh, valiums, the, the suppressants work counter to any long-term recovery of, um, of chronic vestibular disorder. So the suppressing of the vestibular system uh, prevents your brain from compensating for that, that issue. So we are the very first symptom management treatment that doesn't suppress the vestibular system, but just works hand in hand with the, um, the physical therapy and the long-term treatment in training the brain to naturally compensate for that um, asymmetry. Somewhat similar to the tinnitus masking issues and things yeah. of that nature. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Dupro, could, could you give us a little orientation? Of how, how does this relate with the Epley maneuver? Because we have a lot of colleagues that do that, you know, in the yeah, clinics yeah. and so on. And would this be a replacement for that maneuver or would it be a, in addition to that maneuver somehow? Uh, maybe as a compliment. So early on uh, in 2019, we had multiple clinical trials that were ongoing. Um, calorics on physical therapy and other things, nausea associated with uh, chemotherapy. And all, of course, all these trials got cut sh short in academic centers uh, thanks to COVID. And so we had to turn around and start a telehealth trial whereby people we recruited online would give us their uh, diagnosis and we send them a device for some number of weeks. And then we can go into the details of this. And what we found is that we had the usual categories of people that get helped. So, um, so we had BVPV and vestibular migraine, vestibular neuritis, labyrinthitis, and associated, and many S disease. And among the people who had who reported to us that they had BPPV, we found that most of them had gone through the FLA maneuvers maybe five, maybe twenty times, oh, and it just not, did, did not help them. And of course, that matches, you know, the published literature that. A play maneuver revol I mean, resolves issues of BPPV in about 70% of patients. There's like 5 or 10% of patients for whom it doesn't do anything. And then we have about 20% of patients who feel that a play maneuver makes it worse. And so these are the typical BPPV patients that we get. And those, it seems that uh, we help them. We have fairly uniform uh, success rate. We ask people to try the device for two weeks and report on every episode and so on. And we find that 70% or so uh, of patients across all diagnosis categories, but especially BPPV, uh, just say that they're better, that EPA maneuvers made them either didn't work or made them worse. And with our device, they were finally able to deal with these episodes of vertigo that they get. Wow. Yeah, it's, it, you know, this has always been an issue with the vestibular issue, with vestibular, vestibular concerns is that um, they would go to the ENT, the first thing you get is an ENG, then you go back and you say, well, you got a little weakness on one side or the other, and, and here's, some, here's some stuff to try to fix that. You maybe give them some Cawthorn Cooksey exercises and, and, and so on. So we really haven't, haven't had uh, a way to kind of treat these things with something that's efficient for quite a long time. Um, and uh, now we're beginning to see more and more audiology people become kind of certified by the American balance system and things of that nature. But um, 
but it, it, it's interesting that there may be a product that could be used similar to a, a tinnitus device that may facilitate a real benefit for, for patients. Um, so, so my guess is this is, is, is not necessarily a, a, a brand new idea, but it certainly is a brand new technology that will be uh, available at some point to, to patients. Um, and, and I know that, that, uh, that this may be available for, my guess is it's more for dizziness patients than it is for vertiginous patients. Is that, is that a true statement? It, it seems to work across the board. I mean, it's not a magic bullet. Uh, across all trials, we find about a fairly uniform success rate of about 70% to 80% of patients report improvements. Uh, for instance, in, in the main years, patients in the main year population, um, they're really happy about the fact that they have this constant kind of dizziness, you know, background of dizziness, but they have these violent episodes of vertigo. And they what they say is that this is really where the device really helps them. It's when they have these very severe attacks. And the device does not cure anything, just like a tinnitus masker, but it helps you cope with it and it helps you deal with your vertigo. Uh, although sometimes it's probably all that's needed. For instance, in one of the trials that got aborted, um, we had on device in a vestibular physical therapy clinic and patients who normally would only be able to go for maybe five minutes with the exercises that make them even more vertiginous than they normally are, uh, were now able to do a full 30 minutes right from the get-go because they were able to cope with their, uh, their vertigo. So That's super, you know, it's, the, the deal is that in the past, uh, the vertiginous patients, particularly the, some of the Meniere's episodes, people just have to go sit next to a wall someplace and hope that they don't fall down somewhere. Uh, so, so this really does offer some hope for patients. Now, uh, I, I know you guys are in an expedited FDA uh, program. So how does that uh, correlate with possible uh, availability for patients with these issues? Yeah. So as you mentioned, in last summer, we received uh, FDA breakthrough designation, de breakthrough device designation, uh, which is to say that the FDA recognizes that we are treating a degenerative condition in a way that there exists no treatment options. And so the FDA has prioritized getting approval for this technology. Now we still have to pass all the same clinical rigor of anything, but the moment we have that done, we'll be fast tracked to approval. So up to this point, we've had roughly 120 people with chronic vertigo in pilot studies, understanding um, who should be included in the, who, who we're helping, how do we help, et cetera. And that's informed what is going to be our pivotal trial, which is the trial that the FDA is asking for. So we've had five uh, conversations with the FDA at this point, and uh, we're proposing them a finalized pivotal trial here soon. Uh, with funding, we'll be able to execute on that. Um, our goal is to have that done in roughly a year. And then with this uh, breakthrough designation, this fast track to the FDA, we hope to have FDA approval by late 2023. Wow. So this would be then available to our to our patients that uh, that have this issue, so um, so are there some upcoming trials that uh, that patients can sign up for somehow to facilitate the the development of the product and get it to that place where it'll become available? Yeah. Uh, so, like I said, we recently completed a 120-person trial. We recruited from people who came to our website and, you know, signed up saying, let me know when this is available. The upcoming pivotal trial will actually be an at-home uh, trial, so the device will be sent to um, patients. It may be a little bit more region-specific, as the FDA has asked for uh, the patients at the beginning of the trial to have a physician checkup, but if someone is interested in participating in this trial, if they sign up, uh, when we have IRB approval, and this is a kicked off trial, uh, we will let everyone in our database know about it and let them know which physicians are um, 
and what clinics are, are recruit, helping us recruit these patients. Um, so that's, that's the big upcoming trial. Uh, we anticipate doing additional trials as well. The time frame is a little bit uh, less clear uh, just because we are focused on getting this pivotal underway, but we'll be looking at long-term improvement. You know, what happens with the dizziness handicap inventory when this is given to someone for six months or 12 months? Um, you know, what happens to the cost of care? What happens to, you know, are, are they missing as many days of work? You know, kind of understanding that that true quality of life improvement, not just the immediate are we helping the the individual episode, but you know how does this improve people in the long term? Um, eventually, we want to look again at uh, um, using this with uh, physical therapy. Um, but yeah, so we have a bunch of other trials that we'd like to do. But right now, the the best way, if anyone who's interested wants to find out more, it's to go to our website uh, www.odolithlabs.com and sign up to be on our on our list. And that's that's how we reach out to people to. Let them know that the trials are underway. Super. So, so this would also uh, be appropriate. That's the also appropriate avenue for not only patients, but for say audiologists or uh, ENT people that would be interested in being involved with your program in the development of the product as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, so we would love to have a multi-site. Um, we're planning on a multi-site trial for a pivotal. And if someone says, you know what, I see a lot of dizziness patients and I would love to be one of these sites that, you know, can offer this to, um, patients, we would love to get in touch with you. Um, you know, walk you through the protocol. We'll, you know, um, have you involved and have an additional site, uh, to, to help recruit and, and move this, this forward. Super. Um, so, so I guess uh, we'll be we'll be looking forward to seeing more from Otolith Labs and this particular product. And how now? How does that? Do you have a slide or something we could you could show us how it actually fits on a patient um, and what the size is these days versus what it was before? Um, I know I saw that in one of the uh, one of the back, some of the background information that was of interest to me, because a lot of patients wouldn't want to have a great big deal back on their head, you know. And and uh, my understanding is that it's really pretty minimal uh, in size anymore. Yeah. So this is the device that we've used in our current clinical trials. Um, the uh... You know, the size is basically what you're going to see in the future devices, both in the clinical trial and when we're um, prescription and ready to go. Uh, very simple headband design right now. So it's un universally ergonomic. You just have to make it comfortably snug. Uh, don't make it too tight. So it's causing headaches or anything. It doesn't have to be that whole hard. And basically the device just has to make contact with a bony area of the head, either the mastoid or the occipital. We've been using the, the right mastoid in our trials for consistency, but um, we've done trials with cadavers to know that you can actually have a various number of placements and, and find it effective. Um, what we're planning on doing for the upcoming trial and then eventually the release is a much more sleek looking device. Um, and there will be a refillable component, essentially the transducer. This is crucial because um, in order for our device to be effective, it, it actually is a very um, precise level of vibration that's required. Um, and so if this gets dropped or somehow loses calibration, it's important that, you know, this is replaced regularly. We can't guarantee this will be calibrated for three years, which is the requirement of a DME. So the, what it would be is a, again, a, a sleek little headband that has a device that's replaced every three months. And when we do come to market, um, we want to price this to encourage trial for those that this works for it's instantaneous and it's profound. Um, you know, a number of people in our trials were saying, you know, I've been able to do things for the first time in 10 years. This is life-changing. Um, and so, you know, this isn't, doesn't have the super expensive components of like a miniaturized hearing aid where you have very, very unique, you know, circuit boards and batteries and stuff. This is, um, it gives us some flexibility where we can encourage trial. Um, we probably would look at a price point of what, patients are currently spending out of pocket right now anyway. Uh, and again, for those that it works, it works instantly and it's, it's pretty profound. And um, yeah. 
Sorry, sorry, sorry something that's huh? fairly, mm -hmm. sorry, but this is something that's fairly remarkable for me as a scientist is that I still have no understanding of is that either it works or it doesn't. We haven't had a single patient say, yeah, after half an hour, I felt a difference. It's always like if they if it works for them, they always say like it was like less than a minute and I knew this was it. So it's I I just still find that just so amazing. But it is an advantage to either it works or it doesn't, and there's no in between. Yes, it's interesting because as a clinician, we could have one or two of these in the clinic and and see how they work as demos. Uh, because it sounds like it either as 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 Dr. DePru says, it, it either works or it does not. And and so the um, so you could just have it as a demo device, and if it's working, then then maybe give it, have them try it for a few days and see how it goes, and then uh, and then actually do an order or whatever is necessary, as we do often with hearing aids to some degree. Yeah. Well, I, I I thank you guys so much for being with us here on this week in hearing and providing some information about a fabulously interesting product that's possibly on the way to really help our patients. So, so audiologists and ENT physicians, as well as any of the patients that see this, you can go to otolithlabs.com and register and be, register for either being a, a professional involved in the project or a patient that really needs some assistance with this type of assistance. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Didier and Sam for being with us today and telling us about your fabulous product at This Week in Hearing.